In the 21st century, fascist political parties and movements no longer openly identify as fascist, which can make pinning down a definition of fascism somewhat difficult. There are plenty of liberal or socialist parties that openly state their aims and objectives, but when it comes to the far right, the politics of fascism are everywhere, yet the term is not. Labels like identitarian, alt-right, populist, traditionalist, come and go in fascist circles, but the core politics remain consistent. Benito Mussolini, the first self-identifying fascist, described fascism as a value system expressed through authoritarian state rule over every aspect of life. Leon Trotsky and other leading Bolsheviks observed that fascism is a reaction to capitalist crises and represents a desperate attempt at counter-revolution by the bourgeois class against the rise of communism. Political scientist Robert Paxton adds that fascism emerges out of a collective state of humiliation or sense of inferiority. Historian Roger Griffin has suggested that fascism is an expression of ultra-nationalism, which invokes a mythical view of history to encourage a rebirth of the nation. Political economist Zach Cope argues that fascism is imperialist repression turned inward, where repressive foreign policy becomes domestic. And philosopher Mark Neoclius describes fascism as a politics of security that moves from social exclusion to physical extermination. What do all these definitions tell us about the totality of fascism as a political project? To answer this question, it is necessary to look at the material and social context through which the term emerges and historically develops. In the late 19th century, the Industrial Revolution had given rise to monopoly and finance capital, which swallowed up smaller capitalists in the domestic market. Eventually, monopolization reached a stage of development where continued capital accumulation was no longer possible within the confines of the nation. There were no more competitors to subsume and no more domestic consumer markets to penetrate. To continue its expansion, capital needed to move outward and reach foreign markets. However, when multiple European countries all began expanding at once, they inevitably bumped up against each other and entered into geopolitical disputes, particularly in regard to their imperialist ambitions in the colonized world. In the case of Africa, for example, European powers gathered together at the Berlin Conference of 1884 to cooperatively decide how they would parcel out the territory and resources of the continent. Africa was divided up into nation-states that represented the colonial territory of this or that European country. World War I erupted when such inter-imperialist cooperation was no longer possible between European nations. The capitalist mode of production had become global, its crises had become global, and for the first time in human history, war had become global. World War I was fought in order to draw a global divide between the colonizing and colonized world, and even though Italy was on the side of the victors, its agreed-upon territorial share of Austria and the Ottoman Empire was never fully realized. Meanwhile, Germany, on the losing side of the war, was severely punished by the Treaty of Versailles, which placed the former European power into an ocean of debt. German authorities knew they could never pay back the debt, and instead tried printing marks as an easy way around it. However, large injections of currency into the German economy caused the price of goods to skyrocket, and Germany then entered a period of severe hyperinflation. German currency became so worthless that rather than using it for exchange, workers found better value in burning marks in their home furnaces to stay warm. Under these economic circumstances, Benito Mussolini in Italy and Adolf Hitler in Germany each rose to prominence by riding a wave of national resentment. Mussolini described Italians as the descendants of the ancient warriors and conquerors of the Roman Empire, advancing a view of the nation as empire and citizens as soldiers. 
While anti-Semitism was prominent in Italian fascism, it played a far more central role in Nazi mythology, which fixated on genetic characteristics in order to determine an individual's racial superiority or inferiority. So-called Aryans were the master race, but were being robbed of their rightful place in the world by the inferior races. Hitler blamed Jews for World War I, the Treaty of Versailles, and all the misery that beset Germany in the aftermath. Fascist Italy and Nazi Germany also each had imperialist ambitions of their own and sought to overturn their nation's economic and social condition. Italy and Germany both understood that they had lost in the global struggle for colonies during World War I, and now they too were at risk of becoming hyper-exploited. But rather than joining the communists in class struggle against capital, they sought to outcompete their capitalist rivals by becoming even more violently imperialist. World War II unfolded as Italy launched an invasion of Ethiopia in 1935, which later expanded into Yugoslavia and French territories. Four years later, Germany began its invasion of Poland, which would later spread to France, Belgium, Norway, Netherlands, Denmark, and much of Eastern Europe. Mussolini and Hitler both referred to their conquests and outward expansion in the language of settler colonialism, as efforts to expand the territory or living space of their nations, what the Italians called Spazio Vitale and the Germans called Lebensraum. These imperialist projects were also turned inward, in the sense that the domestic sphere became a site of ongoing war as well. Fascism militarizes society. Men are created into soldiers to defend the nation, the youth are educated in war and nationalism, and women are valued insofar as they reproduce future generations of soldiers. Instead of addressing the economic basis of capitalist crises, fascism frames socialism, Jews, and other scapegoats as the cause of social problems. Fascism rejects the socialist framework of class struggle and instead views the nation as a homogenous collective in perfect harmony with itself. The idea of the community, or Volk, being in harmony is rooted in the fascist slogan, Blood and Soil. The idea of blood and soil ties the race of the people, their blood, to the land of the nation, the soil, whereby the territory of the nation is framed as a biological organism, Germans share a common genetic heritage that is rooted in the territory of Germany. Social problems facing Germany do not emerge from the people, the community, or the Volk that are in harmony. They emerge from some sort of external corruption of the community by outside forces, Jews, socialists, immigrants, etc. Ultranationalism is an ideology that takes the distinction between internal friends and external enemies to the extreme, and seeks to eradicate all forms of difference or diversity that are perceived as undermining the homogeneity of the nation. When capitalism inevitably enters a period of crisis, fascists understand that the working class is much more open to the message of socialism because it presents them with a conception of the problems they are facing and offers solutions to their problems. Italian and German socialist parties both experienced a great upsurge before the fascists came to power and imprisoned or exterminated virtually every socialist they could find. Hitler's rise to power was a direct response to the German Revolution in 1918 to 1919, which ended in the murder of the leaders of the Communist Party of Germany, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. Hitler and Mussolini understood that socialism has an appeal to the working class, and co-opted the language of socialism to present a false alternative to the problems facing the workers. Ultranationalism, anti-Semitism, or social chauvinism are therefore tools that fascism uses to distract from class struggle in times of capitalist crises. If the bourgeoisie can use fascist politics to convince even a small number of workers that their grievances are not towards capital, but towards Jews, socialists, immigrants, black people, transgender people, or anything else, the public discourse around class war can be crowded out by a discourse of culture war, 
total war, or any other war. Leading theorists of the Bolshevik party were shocked to discover the extent to which the capitalist class was willing to openly scapegoat Jews and feed into anti-Semitic myths of so-called international Jewish bankers simply in order to save their own skin. For example, Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford Motor Company, who was widely regarded as an icon of American industry, was a rabid anti-Semite. After the Bolshevik Revolution, Ford began writing and republishing anti-Semitic literature which was widely distributed across the world. It's in no small part due to the efforts of Henry Ford that anti-Semitic ideas were made so popular and accessible in the early 20th century. But Ford's anti-Semitism was not just theoretical. During World War II, the Ford Motor Company helped repair Nazi military vehicles and profited from forced labor. Henry Ford was awarded the highest honor that Nazi Germany bestowed upon non-German citizens, and he was a close ally with Hitler, who he frequently corresponded and even shared gifts with. Turning working class attention away from class struggle and economics onto cultural issues or eugenics has proven an effective strategy in redirecting animosity towards capitalism. But no amount of persecuting Jews, homosexuals, immigrants, socialists, or disabled people is ever going to resolve the underlying material and social contradictions that produce economic crises in the first place. As time goes on, there's always another crisis to be resolved, always another false enemy to persecute, producing deeper and deeper crises until finally, total mobilization for combating the internal and external enemy becomes necessary what Joseph Goebbels called total war. Ich habe mir es nicht vorstellen können, was denn nun eigentlich noch totaler werden kann. Sollte man überhaupt nicht mehr schlafen oder gar nichts mehr zu essen kriegen und alle Männer tot sein und die Zivilbevölkerung auch noch. Ich, ich konnte mir davon gar keine Steigerung mehr vorstellen. Es war doch schrecklich genug. One could argue that the concept of total war is not unique to the particular circumstance of Nazi Germany in 1943, but a rational outcome of a politics that misdirects class conflict onto illusions of an all-pervasive enemy infiltrating the nation. Socialists generally understand that aspects of humanity like tribe, nation, race, religion, class, or even war are specifically made by humans. Socialists recognize that these aspects of humanity are socially constructed, that they haven't always existed, they have changed throughout history, they will continue to change, and eventually they will cease to exist in their current form. But one of the central values and defining features of fascist ideology is that it rejects any suggestion that these aspects of humanity are socially constructed and instead simply views them as part of the natural order of the universe. This is the type of logic that allows fascism to view social problems as unchangeable, where there is no amount of social reform that can address them. So-called Jewish bankers could not simply be removed from their perceived positions of power because their power was not constructed as deriving from their social position, but ultimately from their genetic lineage. When social problems are attached to the genetic, physical, immutable, or unchangeable aspect of a group, the only solution is to physically annihilate that group and that type of person. In other words, the only way to destroy a social problem rooted in genetics is to physically destroy the genes themselves. Genocide is therefore the only logical resolution to social problems that are viewed as rooted in genetics. This is why the architects of the Nazi death camps describe their system of extermination as the final solution. Genocide is the consistent outcome of fascist ideology. It begins with the politics of exclusion, but following its own irrationality, transitions into a politics of extermination. When fascism is understood in its totality, as a violent attempt to restore the power of capital, 
it becomes clear how the many definitions of fascism come together in a unified way. Class struggle, ultra-nationalist mythology of national rebirth, imperialism, social chauvinism, eugenics, and genocide are all interwoven aspects of a unified whole. Fascism cannot be identified through a single moment, a single policy, or a single individual, but needs to be identified in the ideology and process of political practice in general. The form that fascism takes is based on the social and historic context through which it constructs its historic past, its external enemy, and its aspirations for the future. But the social conditions that it emerges from and responds to remain consistently embedded in the contradictions of capital. This is why it's important to conceptualize the re-emergence of fascism in the 21st century within the broader economic and political context of the current milieu. Economic inequality has reached heights and magnitudes not seen since the 1920s, which leads to various class dynamics and social conflicts that lay fertile ground for the rise of fascism. If we see that fascism is not a policy, personality, or event, but a historical and social process, we can come to better understand the threat that fascism currently poses, not just in one country, but across the world. The global crisis of capital has given rise to social inequality that has been compounded by COVID-19, inflation, rising interest rates, the war in Ukraine, and an overall decline in economic opportunity. The social instability created by these rapid global transformations has forged conditions where the working class becomes more receptive to the politics of the far right. Golden Dawn in Greece, Marine Le Pen in France, Gert Wilders in the Netherlands, Georgia Maloney in Italy, or Donald Trump in America are not isolated symptoms of individual nations flirting with fascism, but part of a broader trend revolving around the crisis of global capital. Fascism begins its strategy with attacks on the easiest targets, the most vulnerable, transgender people, Black Lives Matter, immigrants, the poor, etc. And unless countered and repressed, eventually becomes a politics of open hostility and violence that reaches its logical conclusion at Auschwitz. Fascism is a death cult, and the only way to defeat it is through socialist revolution. This video was made possible by the generous support of the patrons of this channel. If you would like to join them, you can do so at patreon.com slash redpenyoutube.